This is the Impact Report. I'm your host, Katie Elman. The Impact Report brings together students and faculty in Bard College's MBA in Sustainability program with leaders in business, sustainability, finance, social entrepreneurship, and more. These conversations go live the first and third Friday of each month. This week, Bard MBA's Kiana Cardwell and PJ Connolly speak with Don Golden, founder of Just Capital Quotient. Don, thanks for joining Kiana and I. It's kind of interesting. We we are all uh, in the same company and on the same team, and we are interviewing you, Don, um, as sort of us being from the Bard MBA program and, and meeting you in the program and uh, starting a company together. And then uh, you ha- having the uh, lion's share, so to say, of the experience and background uh, in it, what it is that we do, but us also bringing some of the sustainability uh, side of things. And we'll dive into that. But first, uh, Don, I- I'd like to uh, ask you about your professional background. What, sure. uh, what brings you up here today in your work? Yeah. Well, um, first of all, let me just say thanks. It's good to be on this uh, podcast and to join this discussion and appreciate uh, Bard and the two of you and what I've learned about Bard through you and Kiana. Um, Yeah, my background is in the world of international development, and I come at it from a faith standpoint. So I've always been involved in raising money and putting it to work in good uh, nonprofit international human development initiatives. And that led to economic development and then eventually to um, witnessing the power of market based solutions. And I made that segue into the for profit and to market based solutions to the world's big problems. Great. So you, you started off in um, international development then and and sort of human development world aid um type work and i remember i i reached out to you uh on a podcast or after hearing you on a podcast that i was listening to while i was a student at bard and just saying hey it looks like you're coming into this world uh that we're currently in kiana and i and at least studying and and would love to be able to help you out in in any way possible or wherever it might make sense. And lo and behold, a year later, we kept talking and we sort of had a consultancy out of that. Could you explain um, a little bit more for the audience about this consultancy and uh, what it is that we do? Sure. Uh, And just uh, be careful who you reach out to because it might be an ongoing conversation. Um, Yeah, I, you know, I ended up talking to a lot of people and and really just approached it as a kind of spiritual exercise. Who does the divine bring into my life and for what reasons and what might we be able to do together and and learning about uh, you and what you uh, were studying at the time at Bard. uh, I realized that there was a great synergy because, you know, there are many spiritual coaches and in business, and that's all very valuable and very important. But my interest is kind of in mission, you know, getting things done, seeing things manifest in the world to do good. And I just don't have the background or the skills in sustainability and business. Um, So I was really looking for someone with your skills, and then you bringing Kiana in. And so just Capital Quotient kind of does those two things. Um, my kind of spiritual and then impact interest is about uh, self-discovery as a path to a vocation and impact. And then um, moving from there into how, how can you subject those intentions and desires to a critical examination, both in the world of doing good and impact, but also in sustainability and in business. So we help uh, business leaders find their own heart for impact, and then we help them build an actual business strategy. And we mostly focus on small and medium uh, uh, enterprises. Great. Thanks. That was helpful. Kiana, did you 
Yeah, can you talk yeah. a little bit, you talked a little bit about it, but can you talk a little bit more about uh, kind of who our clients are and, and what types of services we, we offer them? How do we actually kind of get to that point? Yeah, I, on, on one level, the demographic is what I would call the uh, successful and discontented business leader. Uh, their success, they have enough margin to think about which way they're going to go, but they have some kind of insight that this success is not going to be enough. They have a, they have an internal uh, awareness that things are not right with uh, the market, with the economy, and with capitalism as it is, and they want to do something different, and they have that entrepreneurial interest in making that happen. And so that's taken us a lot into the Midwest, into the sort of the mid middle of America, because my background is in not only in theology, but in kind of moving Christians into a more progressive and uh, forward looking space. A, a lot of our clients are kind of in that transition as well. What, what is really relevant about my faith, not just a ticket to heaven someday, but what, how are we bringing heaven to earth today? And so that's that's the kind of demographic. And and you know, previously I, when, when I was uh, in the more activist world, I didn't really have access to Middle America in this way. And so this is really taking taking me right into the heart of where the real economy is being built, and that is just Americans across the country, good people trying to do good things, and we get to kind of come alongside them. Yeah. Could you speak more about what you've seen change and how you've, um, I guess, over your time in your uh, your roles of doing good, so to say, and, and impact? What has changed now to bring us to this point where we're at, where we're now working in middle America, in the Midwest, with industrial <laughs> business owners in some cases? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, there are a lot of things that we could talk about, but I think very pressing on the human psyche is the challenges of wealth inequality and planetary degradation moving beyond the special interest camps into the actual real world where people live. Um, I think the trade winds of the economy are responding to that. And so many business leaders are feeling that pressure, even if it's a negative pressure through regulation. Um, so it's, I think we're, we're kind of entering a, a terminal stage of uh, the way things are in the status quo and a, a kind of Milton Friedman type of capitalism. Uh, and, and more and more people are waking up to it uh, from different angles. So I think that is uh, fueling the convergence uh, between the general world of faith and charity and doing good, but also uh, the work, the very technical specialist kind of work that uh, you do at, at Bard. And what are some of the kind of lessons or techniques or I don't know, ideas that you've kind of taken from that development world and been able to apply to business and sustainability. Yeah, I divide that probably into, into two. What, what I thought might be very minimal, which was kind of the spiritual side. I'm, I'm a pastor and a theologian. Um, and I, I thought that would be a minimal role. Uh, and then the second part of that is what is actual impact and and you know, the, the world of human development specializes in trying to see transformation happen at the local level by local people in a sustainable way. Uh, and people who are just generally trying to do good really haven't thought through, you know, so they often just give to charity. Um, so those two areas, deep impact. But on the spiritual side, I have found that whether you are Christian or have a religion or not, you do need a source for the energy that drives you to do good in the world. And that energy is in your own beating heart. You know, it's, it's in your own DNA. And so we've actually developed a very specific course, which I call the necessity of you, um, which is really just, uh, and it, it does require faith, but not a 
type of denominational type of faith. It, it, it has, it's about faith in you as a living being and probably that history has some point to it, you know, that it has some uh, direction. And I, that has proven to be a really good, the, the interaction between uh, that energy in yourself and um, the work to understand true sustainability and innovation in your business, you, you got to have a spiritual source of energy to motivate you to do that. So they actually work together really well. Fantastic. Would you be able to go into a little bit more about this, um, you know, taking the, the what you what we have called impact to 101 to 401 and and now are calling beyond charity mm. um could you go into that a little bit more and sort of yeah yeah sure apart? yeah i mean just for the sake of communication to to use hyperbole and to kind of overstate uh charity has some big shadow sides to it uh, uh, you know, charity thinking when it comes to the work of of aid uh, creates dependency. So we all know that you know helping can hurt sometimes. To quote a popular book in uh, my circles, when helping hurts. Um, but I think even more deeply, if you if you divided the entire world uh, economy up, only four parts of 200, two parts of a, of 100 would be charitable dollars. So the, the, real econ the real economy is hardly even touched by charity. And so it's the economy itself that needs to adjust. A, a second part of the, of the problem with charity thinking is I think it robs you of your deepest purpose when you can sort of delegate your, the impact that you're designed to make to professionals. And it kind of frees you up. You get a tax deductible receipt that makes you feel good about being in the world. But, you know, I worked in the charity world all the way up to the very largest charities in the world. The, the, the last charity I was in was one of the largest in the world. And I could see its tremendous limitations on bringing sustainable change. It is the economy that must change if we are going to engage these terminal problems of wealth inequality and uh, and planetary degradation. Uh, and so we've developed a very simple four stages, you know, and and the first two are covered very well often by charities. And that is number one, wake up. You're not the center of the universe. The world is out there. It has needs and you might be able to do something. So that's 101. Be aware of the world. But that leads you to perhaps maybe want to get off your backside and do something and to engage. And so maybe volunteerism, you know, you might pick up, you might go swing a hammer somewhere. You might go out and volunteer and, and soup kitchen or something like that. And that gets you engaged. That gets you more proximity to the actual problem and people involved. But there is a massive chasm between 201 and 301. 201 of engaging, but 301 is in solution building and hopefully the charity that you're involved with is doing that and you should go deeper you should find out what is their theory of change what is a theory of change oh i didn't know there was such a thing learn about that because you might as an entrepreneur even bring something more that they hadn't thought of the economic elements perhaps of what's underpinning that problem and then 401 is how does that change get sustained by local people in local contexts over the long period. And I think all of us are, are we have an innate uh, drive to be involved in that whole process. And charity thinking only takes us to the first two. They're very critical, they're important, but uh, especially we need more entrepreneurs in that uh, solution building 301 level. So we try to help business leaders understand that. One way that you see this active is you know, look at someone on social media with a big following, an influencer of some of some sort. You'll always see at the, you know, in the in the fine print on their website, X percent, one percent of of our proceeds go to charity, and it's sort of like 
if I get big enough and if I have enough influence, I'm going to give a portion of what I do to charity. And that's okay, but the shadow side is it's also kind of lame because you might have the ability to create a whole new response to that solution and you should lean into it. And if you're one of those sort of woo-woo spiritual teachers trying to get people to wake up, put some of that woo-woo in solution building and, and contemplate new uh, solutions to some of our uh, deep undermining problems. And so I think we're all, we all exist to be part of this unfolding creation, this unfolding life process. And we don't want to delegate that to any professional to do it for us. We want to bring our whole self to that. Fantastic. If I can, I want to, I want to tease something out to maybe make it even more concrete of, so how does like a small and medium sized enterprise in the Midwest who might do something like commercial painting or commercial applicating or you know is a franchise of a larger company how are how are they engaging in this and going beyond just donating money to charity or going to volunteer somewhere how are they becoming part of the solution and and really you know eventually getting to that 401 helping other communities or people at the root level of some some major problems to actually take ownership and really create long-term sustainable solutions yeah well the process that we've come up with which has been a dialogical process with partners and we've just started with the assumption that there is an answer to your question and they've begun with a curiosity and over time we've developed a, uh, a framework and the one of the first things that we do with this sort of spiritual exercise is we we expand the definition of capital from profit to four elements so profit people places and planet and those are it's kind of taking the whole externalization idea of um a, a back and saying no we're not going to externalize our costs we're actually going to look at our costs and it's across those four capitals but when once you start looking into that for example, in place, you can say, I want to go beyond charity, the way we just talked about. But when it comes to planet, what has been amazing to me is that I never, for example, with paint, understood what the spiritual elements are of paint. And through the, working with some applicators and painting companies, I came to realize that it is deep in the human species to beautify, protect, and preserve. We literally have to do that. If we don't beautify anything, we don't agree on anything and we don't get anything done. We have to beautify. We also have to preserve and protect our assets. They, they will collapse under the weight of gravity and time and wear and tear. To survive, we have to preserve and protect. So sort of the faith idea comes in to say, well, if that is true, then there must be a way to do it sustainably. And so we're really just trying to work with clients to see then bring them whole their whole selves to that work and then we ourselves learn and so we actually have three clients that together working with sherwin williams as some of their biggest applicators i call them the apostles of paint because they're like taking good news to this whole industry um, that actually has been an amazing learning experience to me and i think that applies to everything you know, it, that everything that has value has a way needs to have. And by faith, I think we can just assume that we can find a way to do it in a way that gives back more to people and planet than it takes. And that's a discovery process. It's an innovation process. Um, and that is why it takes business leaders putting their whole selves into the work. And can you talk a little bit more about kind of the role of self-discovery in that and kind of how um, identifying and developing an internal purpose can really change the course of a company and even increase profits yeah um this you know turns this, this gives me an inroad to discuss contemplative christianity but more broadly just mindfulness in general and and 
many traditions that teach on mindfulness, the, the goal is to bring the individual to their true self. So here's one way that that helps. There's a lot of greenwashing and virtue signaling going on in the public marketing space around sustainability. But I think our clients who are beginning to recognize that, for example, we ask this question, um, what do you love most about uh, your favorite place to recharge? And they always talk about water or mountains or, or you know, outdoor settings. And so one vision for your environmentalism as a business owner is, wouldn't you like to enrich that instead of rob that for future generations? And yeah, I would. So it's really just linking you to what you care about most, overcoming a kind of platonic dualism that would allow you to live in one way and believe in another way and bring those beliefs more into action. And then that helps us get to what is kind of our overall point at Just Capital Quotient, and that is to help clients compete on impact. That is, it is what I do through my business that uh, makes an impact and draws people to our work, investors and clients, and what I call out loving the world. You know, come to us because you know we're, we're going to put more love. It's like going to a restaurant where the food is made with love. You know, it's just a better meal. Going to a business, a group of painters that are really developing their workforce, even the, their contract labor workforce, really pouring into them, really understanding them, and then believing that we have to beautify, preserve, and protect, and we want to do that for you really well. Um, that makes you more attractive to investors and to, to clients and customers. Fantastic. I wanted to touch on just our our tagline, which has been, which we're going through a bit of a change for those listening in terms of the tagline and just overall branding, I guess, within our company. But um, the, the tagline being, we believe that a revolutionary approach to capitalism is the best pathway to an economy, society, planet our grandchildren can live with. What are we... Can we talk a little bit about what we're changing that to and why why that change is being made? Maybe to just talk a little bit about communications and the branding aspect of things. Too. Yeah. Well, I think brand is is your mission personified or your 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 deepest person is is sort of put out into your to your message. And there needs to be a continuity between the two. And revolutionary capitalism in part is just a recognition that to, in today's world we have one kind of economy there is no vi there's no on the horizon there's no alternative there was another period when you had a bipolar world and you had uh, you had a centralized radically alternative approach to economics that was contrary and it helped influence and inform capitalism the new deal was really born out of how do we holders of power keep power. Well, we better help these poor unwashed people get jobs. Uh, and so it was cynical, but it had a, a balancing effect. We don't have that today. You know, we have uh, now in the imagination and in the future, maybe we will have a very different kind. Maybe we won't have money. Maybe we won't have credit. Maybe that will be the reality. Maybe debt will be resolved. But right now, we have an instrument. And I think to instrumentalize capitalism as a tool and then to purposefully use that tool to the best of your economy today, to the best of your ability today and what is within your power, informed by this self-giving desire to live and love well through with that instrument, to me, that is a revolution. The people that we meet and we get to work with, can you imagine a world where those kinds of people represented not two or five percent but 70 or 80 or nine it would be a different world it would be a revolution and who knows where that would lead in the future to alternative forms of economic arrangement but uh branding and marketing should be a a, a vital expression of your deepest convictions like this and that's why you know we have to go through some revolutions of our own in finding those right words and right messages. Right. 
and uh, we're changing it to around building life-giving economies uh, across the globe and connecting uh, people across the globe. Um, I wanted to, I have one more question really to ask, but before, I wanted to make sure Kiana um, had the opportunity to ask anything else that we might, I mean, we've gone through pretty much our list of questions here, so. Yeah, I mean, I would love to hear a little bit more about that um, idea of life giving. Um, kind of how would you um, think about or define a life giving economy as opposed to one that that isn't? Yeah, well, a number of different ways we could talk about that. But the theologian in me, one of the problems that we have is thirty five percent of evangelicals don't accept evolution as a uh, scientific reality. And uh, that is disturbing on many levels. And, and one of those levels is that life and life systems teach us how life works. And if we see ourselves as part of that, and if we can not only reconcile our religion with it, but use our religion to give us insight about how life works, we can move more into alignment. Um, there's a theological concept called eschatology, which is you know, the study of the end of things. And it's led to all kinds of terrible you know, millenni millennial well, what's it, millennialism and uh, views of the end that you know, what I call religiously sanctioned nihilism, where you, you don't care about this earth because it's going to burn someday and you're going to be floating on a cloud in heaven someday. A lot of people literally have that kind of as a ambient force in the back of their mind because of what they were taught. So beginning to reconcile science and faith and understand that they are both really concerned. Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. So why not imagine life in perpetuity? And Christians are supposed to be the people of eternal life. And what if that was a qualitative reality today? So that's what I see. I, I, I gain a lot of um, energy around helping people of faith come to a more grown-up, adult understanding of this ancient religion that they call their own. Um, so that's that's one angle um, at, at that uh, view of life-giving economies. I think the other is that stakeholder, that um, shareholder economics, that the only, uh, the primary objective of a business is to make money for the shareholder is a death-dealing kind of economics. And this is really just trying to um, point that fact out and create a viable alternative. Thank you, that's super helpful. Great, well, I have, um, I guess, a, a final question here. Um, unless Katie, you have any questions as well, um, feel free to jump in. Um, but, well, I'll ask it, uh, I was gonna ask about books and other things that you're reading, but you're always reading. Um, and you have a lot that you go through, but, um, why don't we do two? One is what are some, some great books or resources or, or, uh, podcasts or things lately that, um, if people are interested, you know, people hear this and are really interested in hearing in, in and around this whole thing that you're talking about, Don, um, especially from you know, the faith side of things are going into more uh, deeper into spirit. What are some things that you would recommend taking a look at, diving into, picking up and reading? Yeah. Um, uh, Frederick Leloux's Reinventing Organizations is a kind of application of integral theory and integral theory in general is something that I loosely subscribe to. It's a it's a very broad category of philosophy that uh, was popularized by, was created by a man named um, Claire Graves and popularized by Ken Wilbur and Don Beck. And it has some controversial elements, but to me, it's central 
idea is emergence, the idea that we are emerging over time into higher forms of consciousness and that consciousness gives manifestation in the real world. That, that's the general idea and there's a lot of power to it and, it and it really does help create a framework in which people of all, all people of good will can find uh, a desire to emerge together. Um, someone who builds on that uh, is uh, Adrian Marie Brown in uh, their book, Emergent Strategy. Really, really awesome, a very sort of more artistic and in intuitive application, um, mostly focused on the world of organizing. And, and you see a lot of uh, maturity and growth even in the organizing approach of, of trying to create common space for people of different views to work work together. So uh, the, those are a couple. And uh, The Purpose of Capital by Jed Emerson. He's a guy that one of the several that lay claim to the term impact investing. Um, that is a tremendous book that also uh, surprisingly delves into some of the spiritual religious roots of uh, impact investing and what I call the new economy and the, the one that we have to build if, uh, you know, just if we want to survive as a species. Uh, that's it. Hmm. That's it. <laughs> Great. Um, last question I have then is, um, where can folks reach you or reach us? And, and who in particular, um, again, for the audience, are, would you say would be more or less our, our, the target audience that we work with and should reach out if they have interest? Yeah. Um, well, visit us on our website, uh, justcapitalquotient.com. And you can get in touch uh, with me directly. I'd, I always, I meet with anybody who wants to discuss these things in any way. Um, and I've always done that and uh, found it to be mutually beneficial over time to do that. But very specifically, I think in this discussion, as we grow, we need more, we especially need researchers uh, to take any question like, what matters about paint? Uh, and in, within two weeks, we need to be as educated as our client on the contours of that industry and begin to find some of the directions that we can help guide. You know, we're not McKinsey and, you know, I, maybe someday McKinsey will have a necessity of you component that helps it find its own soul so it doesn't do horrible things as it has done. Um, but until there is such a thing, we, we kind of, you know, we can provide that sort of pasturing and spiritual insight, but then we have to be able to help tailor it, even to know the right questions. And so we want more folks like you to join us and, and we, we can bring you into contracts and, and, you know, help, help us serve our clients. So we, we would love a, a, a handful of friends from Bard who would like to take this uh, these studies and put it into the into the real world in some ways in which it doesn't feel very sexy. Hey, you're gonna do this, all this study, and then go work with uh, painting and industrial coatings companies. Um, but that is where the real economy churns, and and it doesn't stop. And if it isn't redeemed and if it isn't changed, um, we're gonna be. You know, a friend of mine makes uh, has a company that makes smoothies with bicycle powered blenders and God bless him. That's amazing. I love it. It points to an alternative future, but you know, the, the turbine of the economy is, is not uh, kale smoothies on a, on a bike blender. You know, it's the, it's real things going out, uh, going on out there that needs innovation. So we'd love to um, have barred students and graduates work with us. Great. Thank you so much, Don. Yeah, my and pleasure. Thank you, Kiana, for, for joining. Both. Thanks, thank Kate. For I just have a, a comment, actually. Um, I want to thank Kiana and PJ for bringing you to the series. And, you know, what I've been through the Bard MBA program, um, as have the two of you. And I think something that is missing is this talk of faith and the connection to faith. 
And I think in some circles, people shy away from it because it's seen as being divisive. Um, and I think listening to this conversation and welcoming it as a unifier, uh, I think is really, you know, personally beautiful, but also incredibly important since everything is so polarized now. Mm -hmm. And also to your point about these industries that basically seem, you know, faceless because they're ubiquitous in everyday life. I think those industries are often overlooked um, for career paths and jobs and the workers that do the work are also overlooked a lot. So I'm so impressed with your amplification of these points. Great. And one, one last one, the name, Just Capital Quotient. Yeah. Can you, um, that, can you explain that name? Because sure. there's, there's a name of a big company out there, similarly, Just Capital. Yeah. We are not them. I mean, no. we can say that they ripped it off from us, but we right won't now. say that. Well, well yeah. Yeah. Uh, you might notice that JC is in there and JC is a dude who lived a couple thousand years ago and had some ideas about loving your enemy, maybe not dropping bombs on them, stuff like that, that we've never really taken seriously. And he took it seriously and got it killed. So you can see uh, how it kind of works out in the end. Um, just capital. The, the idea does nod to uh, this universal Christ and this figure of the self-giving human. Um, but the quotient part is that you ought to be able to measure your faith in some kind of real way. Uh, we, we actualize love of God by love of neighbor. And you ought to be able to, especially if you are wealthy and powerful, you should be able to measure, you know, how, how much of this stuff do I put towards doing good in the world. And we care about what we measure. And so the, the idea of the quotient is to be able to really quantify uh, the good that we seek to do in the world. Great. Thank you so much, Don. Yeah, my and pleasure. Thank you, Kiana, for joining. Both. Thanks, thank Kate. You. We appreciate our Loyal Impact Report listeners and hope you can help us spread the word about the series and the important sustainability work of our guests. Please rate and review the Impact Report wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you were inspired by this conversation, share a screenshot on Instagram and tag Impact Report Podcast. Learn more about the topics discussed in today's episode by visiting justcapitalquotient.com. And be sure to head to greenbiz.com or impactentrepreneur.com to read a recap of our conversation. Join us for the next episode of the Impact Report on Friday, January 6th. We'll be speaking with Caroline Vanderlip of Redish. Interested in learning how you can launch a high impact, purpose driven career in sustainability? Check out the resources page from the Bard Graduate Programs in Sustainability for access to free resources to jumpstart your career. Hear from leaders in the fields of climate change, consulting, impact finance, circular economy, and more about how they launch their careers and the tips they have for you to join their industries. Visit gps.bard.edu resources today.